Well hello, it's Cliff here. So hopefully you've just watched the video on removing the neck from your GS Mini for travel. Um, that was a real quick overview video just to introduce the subject. Um, if you're interested, then have a look at this video which has got all of the little technical details. It's a lot more long-winded, so you might want to go and get a cup of coffee. I don't want to spend hours editing it and making a highly professional video because I'm not sure how popular this subject is. So it'll be a bit of a jumble of different clips. You should find all the information there uh, if you're patient and work your way through to the end. Okay, well before I remove the neck, I want to measure the action to see whether it needs to be improved. It seems too high to me, so what I've done is just gone through and check the action. So the first thing to do is to check the neck relief. Put a capo on the first fret, put a adjusting wrench on the truss rod nut and uh, compress the 12th fret and measure the action in the middle. And it should be uh, somewhere around 5 thou, something like that. Um, and so I've set that and then I can measure the, with that set, I can now measure the action. Um, so we're at the 12th fret and we want to measure the height that the low E string is off the 12th fret. Um, got a little taper gauge here so I can slide in to measure that height. And just working in metric, I find that easier than the 64th specifications. It shouldn't be more than 2.38 height of the low E string above the 12th fret. And it's 3.9 millimeters. Now that is far too high. That's a very high action. Um, it makes it uh, very difficult to play and it affects the tuning. Um, when you're at this end of the fretboard. So I definitely need to improve on the action. So while I've got the neck off, I can at the same time uh, order, hopefully, a new set of, set of shims which will change the neck angle and fix that high action problem. It's quite a common problem with the GS Minis as far as a little bit of online research I've done has shown. Well, I've removed the strings completely for this first time, and I've just removed the neck. But I've put it back together now, just to simulate removing it for the first time, to better explain it. So, Taylor used a, a small amount of corking, or gap filling putty, in the joint around the edges. There's a little bit of a gap around there, and to make it look uh, tight, they Put a small amount of corking in there so I think that makes it initially very tight um, and it was quite difficult to remove it I was conscious of not damaging it but once I've got it out I can see little bits of the corking or the gap filling putty flaking off and I think I'll scrape that all off now and just live with a very slight gap there because I want to take the the neck on and off. In order to remove it for the first time, well let's look at the two fasteners. So there's two screws or bolts that I think they're quarter inch Whitworth, British Standard Whitworth, or perhaps the UNC in America, a quarter inch coarse thread. Um, one's a cap screw and one's a hexagon head. Um, so that's it off now and if the strings were still on you can see that I could pull it off, fold the strings over, and store it down beside the body uh, with the strings still on. That should be fine. Okay, so let's just look at these little screws, these little bolts. So we have a quarter inch, probably UNC or Whitworth if you're in England. Um, there's a little spring washer under a cup style spring washer under the uh, allen screw and just a plain flat washer under the bolt and these screws that are holding the neck in were not very tight first of all I removed 
this screw holding it down that way, the Allen screw, and I used an Allen key, and that Allen key is a, what is it, it's an imperial one, it's a 3 sixteenths of an inch Allen key, and down inside there I could loosen it quite easily just with one finger, and the tension I was putting on the end of the Allen key, I can sort of approximate it here, would have been about two to four pounds, not very much, maybe three pounds of force on one finger to loosen that Allen key. And then I removed the hexagon head bolt, that's this one here, um, and used a socket, and that's a uh, imperial socket, 11 millimeters, or uh, I'll have to give you the equivalent in uh, Imperial in a minute, but I didn't take much tension at all on that, literally only one or two pounds of force on that wrench to loosen it. So that was even looser, felt probably too loose, probably wants to be a little bit tighter than that. Um, so once they were removed, it was still stuck in place by the uh, corking or the or maybe just the tightness of the joint as well. Um, so I'll find that out now. I'm going to scrape off the corking and try installing it again and see how much easier it is to remove. So the sockets to remove the bolt is 7 sixteenths of an inch across flats, 7 sixteenths of an inch across flats, or if you're in metric, 11 millimeters seems to fit as well. Let's have a close look at that uh, corking or filling putty. So you can see it there. Oh, it's pretty obvious there. There. See it there? You can see the remains of it there. And if you look down in the pocket, you can see bits of it have broken off there. So I think it's pretty important to scrape off that corking or filling putty um, if you're going to do this procedure and either live with a gap or put some sort of uh, uh, Vaseline or silicon uh, grease in the gap. Or live with the gap because if you have little bits of corking falling in and out of the joint it's going to affect how accurately it fits together and uh, will be a problem so I'm going to scrape that all out now and I'll probably just live with the gap all right so I'm just carefully scraping the uh, semi set corking or putty out of there uh, could actually use this little riffler file just so that there's none in the joint or any little lumps of uh, oil or varnish or bits of wood because I don't I want I want the neck to go back in without being affected by those little particles it needs to come in and out in the same position each time so it's important there's no little bits interfering with that connection. So here we've taken out the shim that had in it a number two in there and a number four in there. Now it's possible when this was assembled in the factory depending on how much care they take that there was little bits of uh, wood chip or burr or caulking under some of this assembly that has affected its position and um, it may not return to the same place when I assemble it cleaned. So it will be very interesting to see if it does return to the same place when I assembled it. Okay so I've carefully scraped and filed off the remains of the corking or putty and I think it was acting like a glue because now when it's removed it slips in quite easily and bottoms into the joint without that grabbing of the 
uh, corking or putty. So I think that'll, that'll be a good thing. There is a little bit of a gap now, because obviously they have to have some tolerance when they CNC machine these joints, because wood moves slightly and uh, cutters get blunt and spring, and so there has to be a few thou gap there. Um, and so they're putting corking in there or putty in there to make it look cosmetically nice, but it's not important for its function. And I think with a slight gap there, it's not very noticeable. It's not going to bother me at all. I think I'll replace the hexagon head bolt with this Allen screw. So it's a quarter inch um, UNC probably because it's American, but it's very similar to quarter inch Whitworth. Um, cap screw with a 316AF hexagon wrench or hexagon key. I'll replace the bolt type with this Allen key type because that means I only have one tool to remove both the screws. I think that'll work. I'll get back to you if it does or doesn't. Just looking at the fastness closely you can see there's threaded inserts in there, steel threaded inserts, and that's the hexagon head bolt there. And there's the Allen screw there. So they should be quite durable because they're actual, actually metal threads. They're not wooden threads. So we're, we're talking... Uh, metal on metal, steel on steel. Alright, well you've got right through to the end of the video. I think I should go through it more slowly and thoroughly now. You've, you're obviously quite interested in this um, and so I'll give some more important finer details because there are a few difficulties. I've just put it back on again, put the neck back on again because I've changed the shims over and I sanded them down slightly to improve the action further. Um, and I realized that, you know, if you don't have experience with threaded fasteners, this could be a bit of a challenge. So I'll just go through it in detail. So in order to remove the screws, uh, how can I show this? So, so you've really got to go by feel. You can't see. What if I hold it? No, it's pretty black there, isn't it? You've really got to... Can you see that okay? You've really got to go by feel. So you're holding your Allen key on the face screw this way, and you've got to kind of feel where the head is. So I'm touching it there on the side, there on the other side. So you ascertain where the head is. Then you find the middle, so the hexagon goes in the socket, and you've got to actually turn it. Well, let's, let's hold it like this. So imagine you're upside down and you're reaching in. Your key is bumping up against the head, and you ascertain where the head is with the key, so they're going around it. So okay, now I've got to drop the key into the middle, and you've got to rotate it until it engages. Now, if you don't realize that's what you have to do, you could be doing that for an hour before you succeed. So find the head of the screw, and then engage the hexagon. And hold it in that way, otherwise it's going to keep falling out, and then apply your turning force and undo it. Obviously you're upside down and you're doing this with your hands out of view, purely by feel. Turn it around until it's loose. Now you've got to get in there with your fingers, and uh, I forget now whether it's finger and thumb or two fingers, and you're applying traction on that screw, one finger that way and the other finger that way. So you're twisting it and undoing it in a in the correct, what is that? You're undoing a screw anti-clockwise, if you're not familiar with screws. So you're turning that anti-clockwise until it comes right out, and you grab the screw and pull it out. And for the longitudinal screw, again, it's a little bit easier, but you're feeling down there, feeling the square the head is, and when you feel the head, then you put the hexagon on the end and turn it until it clicks in. Keep it pushed in and then unscrew it. Now it might be a little bit tight. You might need to use something like a tube just to get it going. If you've made it, 
If you've tightened it fairly tight uh, before, it might take a little bit more force to undo it. You don't want it to be massively tight. You probably should be able to unscrew it with your hand strength if you have average strength hands and fingers. Unscrew it and then just turn that round a few times until it's free enough to then spin it with the shank. Now you're always holding the key in and then get in there with your fingers and apply traction to opposite sides. You're going anti-clockwise and you're just turning it out. Try not to drop it. Got that in your fingers and then you pull it out, lift it out. Now, I shouldn't underestimate that. If you're not used to doing that type of thing with, with fasteners, with screws and nuts, then you might find that quite difficult. So you probably want to practice that a few times. Um, but if you've had a background, a mechanical background, then you won't have too much trouble with that. That's the only caveat I'd say on this procedure, that it does take a bit of practice and a bit of skill to actually feel those screws in there just with an Allen key. That's probably why they use a hexagon bolt with a socket. It just takes a little bit less skill. But an Allen key is nice and simple and light, and you can do both the screws with the one tool. So take your time to do that. Make sure that you can do that. If you're interested, I had too high an action. Um, the original shims um, were replaced with shims sent by the tailor agent um, and it reduced the action down from a very high action of about 3.8 on the 12th fret here where's my ruler so I can pictorially demonstrate it you can use a ruler if you sight it up pretty carefully um, it was about 3.8 on the 12th fret on the low E and when I put the shims in it was reduced down to about three millimeters and um, the target specs are about 2.4 so it was a lot better after I put the replacement shims in but the shims didn't completely fix the problem I don't know whether that was a deliberate policy on the part of um, Taylor just to make sure you don't go too far the other way they err on a side of caution better to have the action too high than too low isn't it uh, so I took the shims out and sanded them down a little bit on a bit of 150 paper. It didn't make much difference, so I now have a uh, height of, where's my specs? I now have a height of about 2.9. So it was about, th originally 3.8, the new shims brought it down to 3, it's now about 2.9. Well that's pretty close, it should be 2.4, so it's a bit less than half a millimetre too high in the action but okay I, I don't really want to pull it apart again now one other thing I want to talk about is the time while it might only take two or three minutes to loosen the screw the, the strings and remove the screws uh, I haven't really included in there the time to tune it back up again so that was a, probably a little bit optimistic I'm getting a bit too enthusiastic let's look at it a bit more realistically so, you know, probably allow yourself five minutes to remove the neck before you travel and put it in your case. And um, when you're putting it back, you're at your destination, you're putting the neck back on. Allow yourself another five minutes to put it on, but then you've got to tune it up. And, you know, your strings might have got a bit tangled over each other and you've got to carefully um, re replace them in the string uh, grooves and, and um, tune it up, that might take another five minutes. So you could be 10 minutes setting it up. So that's a bit more realistic. I hadn't really included the time of tuning it back up again. So you probably don't want to be doing this, you know, all the time. But, you know, if you're going to a destination for a few days, um, spending uh, five minutes before you leave in 10 minutes when you get there is not a big deal. It's perfect. For my situation, we're, get, we're gonna go away for uh, one week in one spot. Quite happy to spend 10 minutes setting up my guitar. Well, this, while this video is primarily about removing the uh, neck for travel, um, I did actually touch on uh, replacing my shims to improve the action. Um, I don't wanna go on to that subject for too long because this video would just become far too long. 
But um, if you're thinking of doing that yourself, have a look at some of the other excellent videos primarily on that subject. You can't just contact Taylor and ask for a set of shims. Um, they're going to be very reluctant to send them to you. They only really want to send the shims to people that have been on their specific Taylor training course because they don't want to uh, have uh, end users having problems and damaging the reputation of their product. Um, you, you would need to approach them very professionally to get the shims. They, want to, they would want a professional email outlining the model number, the serial number, um, the, the uh, height of the strings above the 12th fret, the high E and the low E. They want, they want to know your target height uh, and they want to know the current shims that are installed. So you need to remove the neck and uh, remove the, <coughs> the uh, filler or the corking and uh, carefully um, note those numbers and you know if you approach them politely and correctly they may send you some shims. Well thanks for watching that video through to the end. If you're new to this channel Refined Design please like and subscribe if you found that useful and I'll see you next time. Cheers.